Hey everybody, uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. I can't uh, quite hear myself if I'm being honest. Um, so the thing is that um, I'm going to wager that 90% of you here in this audience right now have no clue who I am, have no clue what my game is, have no clue what my studio is, and I think that that means that I have fulfilled the mission statement of being an indie game developer. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, my name's Jay Kidd. I am the creative director and lead designer uh, for Wraith Games. Uh, we're a Cincinnati, Ohio-based uh, game development studio. Um, so, the thing is that our big project right now is called Collapsus, and it is a puzzle game that features a rotation gimmick. Uh, you can pick up your device, you can rotate it, uh, move it all around. Now, the thing is that I actually give a lot of talks on accessibility, um, mostly at universities, uh, but I've been, done a lot at, uh, at other events and everything. Nothing, nothing uh, GDC size, um, usually a uh, little smaller than GA Conf size. Um, so that means talking to a lot, of, a lot of students about accessible game design. Well, here's the thing. Today, that's not exactly what I'm supposed to be talking about. Because all of you know the importance of game design. I'm not here to try to sell you the reasons to make your games accessible. You know that. That's why you're here. So when Ian asked me to come speak, he's like, well, just talk about collapses. Do kind of a post-mortem. Which is a skosh difficult just because collapses isn't technically finished. It will be next week um, if I don't have to go kill my lead programmer, but not technically finished. Well, the other thing is that a, a new friend of mine, I'm not going to say who because that might be a little weird, uh, told me that if I'm going to be talking about Collapsus, to not just dump a feature list on people. There's more to accessibility than a features list. So this is my first time really talking to anyone about Collapsus. So I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you the story of this game. So, I started making Collapsus all the way back in 2006. Now, our team, we've been around since 2005, so a uh, little, little bit a year you know, after we, we were founded. The thing is that we were making absolute garbage to go up completely for free on the web. We call them our 50 terrible prototypes. Now, Collapsus was made for one of my moms. She loved puzzle games. Of course, uh, if you do some maths in your head real quick, you'll realize that YouTube wasn't exactly a thing yet when I started working on Collapsus. So I wanted to make something like Bejeweled. Well, that, uh, that doesn't work if you've never seen Bejeweled played. You've only seen screenshots. But I was a Tetris fan. I wanted to make Bejeweled through the lens of Tetris. I gave it to my mom. Oh, honey, thank you, but it hurts my eyes. What? Oh, it hurts my eyes. I, I don't know what that means, but okay. I just wanted you to be proud of me. It's like, oh, I am proud of you. Okay, cool. So a few years pass, uh, and then I meet my, at the time, uh, at the time she was a random girl in a cosplay line, but she's now my wife. And I was uh, trying to be like, oh, baby, I make video games. <laughs> like, well, I love video games. So I'm like, I know, we're at a convention. <laughs> <laughs> what have you made? Nothing good. <laughs> but I showed her Collapsus, and she absolutely fell in love with it. But at the time, I hated it. This little tiny prototype, which looks nothing like Collapsus eventually became. Well through one fateful sort of, sort of event. We had just lost our publisher for physics, which was a first person puzzle game we were working on. Uh, that was Game Pro Labs, if any of you remember Game Pro Magazine. Uh, they had gone bankrupt and were no longer gonna be publishing our game. And we wanted to switch to an entire new engine, Unity. But none of our team knew how to use Unity. Christy, my wife, suggested that we make Collapsus. Now the rest of the team was like, Collapsus? What is this Collapsus thing? And she told them that it was something special. Three months later, I'm sitting in my living room with a whole bunch of my friends working on this game, and I pass it to my buddy Ryan. And Ryan takes one look at it, and he's like, what do you want me to do with this? 
play it. You, you play the game. Tell me if it's any good. Nah, I can't do that. <laughs> it's not that hard. No, 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 no. I can't see what's going on. I'm colorblind. <laughs> You're, I, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, I'll fix that. I'll make sure you can, can play it. Six months after that, I am at GDEX, which is the Midwest's largest game development expo. Uh, that's their free shout out for this. <laughs> I'm there, I'm with my team, we're showing off Collapsus, and a couple guys walk up. And I'm like, hey, would you like to play Collapsus? And they're like, actually, yeah, yeah, we absolutely would. Start picking it up, playing it, loving it. Like, oh man, uh, these shapes, uh, why'd you put them in? Like, well, uh, colorblindness exists, and uh, we wanted to make sure that colorblind players could play. And I'm like, you have no clue who we are, do you? Not even a little. And they're like, uh, we're actually Craig and Brian with the Able Gamers Charity. Would you like to talk with us about accessibility? Now, keep in mind, uh, I'm an ex-Mormon, so anytime I have a couple of guys come up to my <laughs> physical space and say, would you like to talk about thing, I get a little weird. But I, I did. I did talk to them about accessibility. And it blew my mind. It never occurred to me that there were so many people who just couldn't play my game. For instance, like, like one of the biggest things about it, you physically move your tablet around. You have to get it up in your hands. It's like a Rubik's Cube almost. Uh, what about people who can't use their arms? What about people who have fatigue? in their arms when they try to use them? You know, why isn't there a solution for that? Why aren't there on-screen buttons? Why aren't there, isn't there Bluetooth key, key controls? Things like that. Shortly after that, we ended up uh, getting published. We were gonna be releasing on Switch, PS4, PS Vita, Xbox One. We were Steam greenlit shortly after that. Oh man, we gotta think about all these, these controllers. We gotta think about these keyboards and things. Why not make it completely remappable? After that, I would lay in bed every single night and think, what about this group of people? They can't play that game. They can't play it at all. Well, shortly after that, the next GDEX rolled around. And we won the most accessible game at GDEX presented by the Evil Gamers Charity. <laughs> Do not clap for this. I want to say that at the time, we just had like 10 accessibility options. One of which, uh, we decided to go in and make a colorblind palette for 10 different colorblind types. Um, because we, we saw in the research that there were like three that were normally like thrown around and everything. We wanted to support 10 of them. Uh, and we considered that like one feature is you know, just the colorblind palette. We'd had like 10 features. And at the time, I'm like, I want to push further and further and further. And we got this award in a time when no one was thinking about accessibility. We got this award because we put the bare minimum effort into making the game playable by more people. So I'm really proud of this award, I really am. But I wish that they had seen the, the Collapsus that exists today. Right now, Collapsus has over 40 accessibility features. I think at this point, it might be creeping closer to 50. And it's because I was able to talk with, with people like the Able Gamers. It was because I was able to talk to my friend AJ Ryan, who, by the way, uh, if, if you follow him on Twitter, you know who he is. He can only play games with his feet. And so uh, he would go out and he would give accessibility talks to people. And like seriously, he is one of my heroes. He actually stepped away from giving talks for a little while. And in that time, uh, people started asking me to come give talks. Because uh, after him, and trust me, he is the accessibility expert. After him, I was the person in our area who knew the most about accessibility. And I wanted to step up. I wanted to make sure that I was doing him proud and I was doing the community justice. And I'm just still some beginner up on stage talking you know, about what I was able to implement. We live and work on the backs of giants who have spent their entire careers learning how to make games that everyone can play. We are in such a fortunate time to be able to look at the work that other people have done and before we even begin our projects, say, we're gonna take that, we're gonna do that thing. 
And that is, that's something that makes me so happy. And if I had the ability, I'd put a hundred more of these features in here. We are sadly running out of things to actually include in a puzzle game. But that's uh, an entirely different thing. Now, this is supposed to be some postmortem, you know. Uh, so after we put in the shapes for colorblindness and after we put in the, the different colorblind palettes, I was waking up in a cold sweat again. That's mostly to do with my own anxieties, less to do with about stressing over accessibility. Uh, though I will say, um, after we started talking about accessibility in our studio, um, it turns out that over 80% of our team, there are 12 of us and two interns, over 80% of our team are disabled developers. And no one wanted to talk about it until accessibility opened up. And that's the weird thing, too. Uh, we ended up putting in dyslexia-friendly font options. I'm dyslexic, and that never occurred to me until I started reading about it. I'm like, <laughs> there are dyslexic-friendly fonts? <laughs> Holy crap, I could have been reading a lot better. You know, my wife, uh, she's mostly deaf. <sighs> she's like, oh, yeah, no, no, there are, like, games that do, like, like sound stuff, you know, uh, stereo mono toggle, stuff like that, you know. Oh, uh, ah, okay, we'll put that in. Because it got the floodgates opening. It got us to have a dialogue about, you know, what we needed in the game. So, again, back to the colorblind stuff. We ended up uh, sitting down and reworking all of the art in the game. So the game already had a really simple pop art aesthetic that was specifically designed to be bright and vibrant, but also minimalistic. Every bit of our UI and UX was created around the idea of let's provide exactly what is needed, no more and no less. Create something really clean. We went and we redid every single bit of art to make it completely colorblind, like color changeable. So what we did with it was if we had an object, a game object that had multiple different like things on it, like our mascot, Leon, He's a big yellow vest, or a big orange vest and a big yellow hat and, a, and green skin. He's a chameleon. That's not weird that he has green skin. We took every color layer and we made it white. And we broke up the texture into like six different parts of different sizes and we created uniform pivot points between them. So that way that each little texture was about the same size as putting all the textures together. You know what I mean? So like it wasn't like we were adding more storage requirements. And then the engine itself could say, hey, players can set their own green. You want green to be red? Sure, we don't care. You want green to be yellow? Make it happen. You want green to be anything that you could put a hex code, an RGB value, or a little color slider on? Make it happen. Right there. Just by making sure that the, the code itself was what was turning on the colors. The colors. Well, you know. We had remappable controls, we had all these color line features, we had the stereo mono toggle, we had all that jazz. Well, after that, we had to start thinking, okay, subtitles. There's no speaking in the game in any uh, appreciable way, at least. There's little, little squeaks and squirks and everything. But we had to make text that was completely scalable. The text backgrounds, you could turn those black if you wanted to. That way they're more easy to read. You want to make it big, make it big. You want to make it small, make it small. You want to put throw anything onto a dyslexic-friendly font, you can. We realized that some of the little flashing elements, all that wonderful game juice that developers, especially indie devs, like to put in, intensity sliders. You want a lot of screen shake, give you a lot of screen shake. You want a little screen shake, a little screen shake. You want no screen shake, you don't need screen shake, turn it off. Every facet of the game, we wanted to cater it to the individual players. And I think we did a pretty good job of that. We've even started working on our next few games. And since we didn't have the, oppor uh, the opportunity to put in these other things into Collapsus until late in the cycle, and yeah, that actually <laughs> means that for the first like three years of development, Collapsus was basically unplayable garbage to so many people. And then we started opening the floodgates. We added all of these features just because we thought it was a good idea. Thank goodness that we were working on a puzzle game. 
Thank goodness that we were working on something that was modular enough that we could, we could make changes later in development. Because of these features, we could have released Collapsus about two years ago. Uh, we haven't. Collapsus isn't out yet. That's why it's so weird doing a post-mortem. I actually don't really talk about Collapsus at length at all unless I'm behind a booth trying to sell it to people. It's not a post-mortem. But what it is is an opportunity that, to, to talk to people about something that is so important to us, so important, I, should be for everybody. So, Collapsus. You're probably wondering why is it called, or why is my talk called Collapsus Puzzles for People? All the way back in that, uh, that early 50 terrible prototypes uh, mindset that we were working on, we had originally called the game Collapsus Puzzles for People. But that's what we're trying to do now. The game isn't called Collapsus Puzzles for People anymore. But in a sense, we have made it for people, for Everyone, as much as a game can be for everyone. Because again, it, we're, we're making entertainment media, right? You know, not everyone is going to like everything that we do. But at the same time, why shouldn't we give them the option? If they think it's a cool idea, if they think it's a cool concept, why not make it an option? Now, this is the part where I want to talk about some hurdles that we had. Because there were so many hurdles. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. A lot of those hurdles were me sitting down and saying, no, I absolutely don't want this to be a change to my masterpiece. And then I realized, man, I'm being real selfish. And I think that that's gonna happen, you know, especially with a lot of developers, where it's gonna be like, no, I'm not gonna change this piece of my game for other people. Like, why would I? Well, one of the big things is we have these little things called chameleon blocks, which is why we have a mascot who's a chameleon. With every single break that you make, the colors change on the block. So they start in a cycle. They start blue, then red, then yellow, then green, et cetera. Uh, and then they, they match differently. Back in the early days of this game, I thought it was a really clever obstacle. I thought it was a great way, like, no, 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 no. Players are going to have to memorize which ones are chameleons. Yeah, no, that's a really terrible idea. I never really even thought about people who might be distracted in the moment. I never thought about people who were, you know, had some sort of memory deficiency where they couldn't really keep track of it. I didn't even think about the people who had been so overloaded, you know, during their, during their daily lives that they didn't want to have to deal with that kind of mess. The game is difficult enough. It's a puzzle game, right? Puzzle games are supposed to be somewhat challenging. I don't need to add some sort of artificial difficulty to my design to make it harder. That's when we added Zen Mode. Zen Mode has none of these chameleon blocks. You don't even need to worry about them. Zen Mode also has no timer to speak of. Now, in the normal game, the timer, you can sort of toggle off and on. Um, but there's a resource management mechanic that's key to this game. Zen Mode turns it off. Turns off the chameleons. Turns off all of that. You can sit back and you can chill. Well, what else did we do? We put a little hint in there. We put a little chameleon hint. As a chameleon spawns in, it makes a little notice. Whenever uh, you wait a little while, the chameleon makes a little notice. If you click on Leon's face in the upper right hand or the upper left hand corner, uh, Leon may, or the chameleon makes a little notice. We put a little slider in there, you know, where you can like say, "Oh no, I want the 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 thing to last longer." The little hint. I want the hint to come up more often. And for players who don't want that sort of thing, we allow them to turn it off. Because, you know, why can't players dictate their own experience with a game? This entire journey that we've spent on Collapsus, I've, I've had to wonder, why is it that game developers, you know, feel such an ownership on their game? Why do they feel that every single piece of content needs to be meticulously curated. Why is the developer's vision of how to play the only way that you can play? I'm reminded of like Griffball. Uh, by show of applause, who here knows Griffball and Halo? 
Thank you. That's emergent gameplay. And, and I know there's a, there's a lot of talk about emergent gameplay, but why does emergent gameplay have to exist on a macro level? Why does it have to be entirely new game modes that players just sort of event, invent? Why can't there be cool ways for players to be like, no, I'm going to change up in the settings how these things work? It's almost a little selfish, isn't it? You know, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of the idea of authorial intent. And I'm uh, going to bore you all a little bit. Authorial intent is one of the conversations that happens the most at my studio. Like I said, there are 12 of us, and all of us are massive, massive nerds. So we talk about fiction a lot. And the idea of authorial intent comes up just way too much. Like, oh no, is the, is the author's word the be-all, end-all? Or is, is the person's own experience what truly makes the art? Well, uh, I think for Collapsus at least, we've decided that players can help make their own experience. We can put in a frame, we can put in a structure, but we want to make that structure as bendable and breakable as humanly possible. Now, that is not going to be doable for every single game. I know that. But if, if games like Minecraft, uh, Minecraft with its own problems notwithstanding, if games like Minecraft can say, we have this way for you to play, and then we have all these other ways for you to do things, I think we can give that a try. The indie space is uniquely built for something like that. Like, that's kind of the thing. We grew up, us indie developers, grew up making or playing games, and we were inspired to make our own. And I know so many indie developers who have disabilities. And these indie developers with disabilities, they won't for a second think, oh no, I should make something that helps me, you know? Like, I'm not exactly having the best time with my game. I'm personally not exactly what you call neurotypical. Um, I, I get a lot of anxiety. Uh, I have uh, Asperger's syndrome. Uh, many of you probably have noticed that by the fact that I'm uh, talking the way I am. Uh, ADHD, obsessive compulsive. I am disabilities in a handbasket. And when I was developing games early on, I always thought, yeah, no, no, my, my needs don't really matter. They don't really factor into the kind of product that I'm making. Product. As an indie developer, over time I've learned that Games are more than product. Games are art form. Games are expression. Games are a way to bear your soul to the world, even with a little tiny puzzle game that you know only a few thousand people are going to play. And I want to call out to the AAA developers, the ones in the room, the ones who are going to be listening to this talk later, I know that sometimes you're a giant mechanical hydra that uh, every little thing has to be approved, every little thing has to be uh, thoroughly gone into. And when you're trying to make a product for the widest swath of players possible, it can be hard to think about players with individual needs. And I applaud you, everyone who's come out here today to, to learn more about accessibility, to, to talk about accessibility, to try to, to you know, find ways to make your games playable by more people. And that's a good thing, playable by more people, you know, especially in the AAA space. You want it to be played by everybody. And with an indie game, don't you want everybody to play your game? Don't you want to bear your soul to as wide of an audience as possible? I make games because I need games. My whole team needs games. Ever since I was nine years old, I wanted to make video games. And uh, that same mom of mine uh, always told me, she's like, well, you could get a real career you know, you could, you could get a real job. I like, know I want to make games. And then when I turned about like 14, 15, she's like, okay, if you're going to stick with this, why don't you join like Sega or something? 
I, no, Mom, I, I, I want to make my own games my way. I want to make it with my friends. I want to make art. So why, why do this? Why, why put all these accessibility options in there? I'm going to be honest with absolutely all of you in a way that I have not been able to be honest with even the own members of my team whenever we talk about accessibility. We have a lot of meetings about accessibility because I am, I am really championing it around the studio. And being creative director, uh, what I say goes. So if they don't, <laughs> if they don't want to put in controller remapping, well, we don't ship until they do. So uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, lead programmer Mark, uh, he hates this. Because I'll be like, hey, do this. He's like, that's going to add three more weeks. And I'm like, that's fine. He's like, we got to get it out. And I'm like, I know. Do it. I've never been able to share why it's so important to me. And I think that it was listening to these talks today that really opened up why. I'm, as you probably noticed, I'm speaking a little off the cuff. I had something so prepared. I had a list of, of everything that Collapsus did, everything that we were striving to do before release, and you know, little anecdotes of why we should, it, or should do it. But no, 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 I changed my tune the second I got in here, because I think you all understand this. The reason I want to make these games the way I want to make them, the reason I want these games to be as accessible as humanly possible is because there are games that I want to play that I can't. And I've never really admitted that to myself. You know, if, if there's a game that I have struggles with, I'm like, no, no, it's just not for me, you know? That game community's elitist. You know, that game's poorly designed. Uh, I actually, uh, I, I teach on a high school level. I teach game development for a 501c3 charity. Uh, we go around to different schools who order our program as electives. Um, and then it's low income schools. They teach STEM and art and stuff. And the first thing I do, games literacy. We play a bunch of games that I've curated and then they, uh, they, they then make their own games. And we do that from an accessible standpoint. We do that from the ground up saying, okay, let's make it accessible before they even know that there's another way to do it. Because if you learn something one way, it is so hard to unlearn that. But yeah, when I see a game, I think, oh, no, it's poorly designed. Sometimes it's really not poorly designed. It's just not designed for people like me. And that's the thing, is it's so easy to say, OK, no, I made this game and it's not accessible. It's bad. I'm going to tell you right now, your game's not bad. But wouldn't you want more people to play it? Wouldn't you want everyone to play that thing that you've spent years working on? It's so important to me because I've made so many excuses for why I can't play. And the second that someone brought to my attention that I was excluding other people from playing something, from playing something that may have been their favorite game, we don't know. I don't, I'm not going to sit here, stand here claiming that Collapsus will ever be anyone's favorite game. But the second that I'm like, oh, there's someone who this may have touched in some way that, that will never have that opportunity. Or at least the opportunity will be so steep that it is so prohibitive that they won't want to play it. They won't want to get past the hurdle because the chameleon blocks make the experience worse for them. Because some of the, some of the animations are too intense for them because they literally cannot see the shapes on the game. It wrecked me. It, it completely ruined me. Every night, I would sit up and think, who am I forgetting? I got to be forgetting someone. And that's not going to be a design philosophy that uh, a lot of you can do. And I am not going to endorse that design philosophy. My studio is a zero crunch studio. 
Um, so we specifically make sure that everything is planned out and scheduled to the T so that no one is pushing themselves to death. And yet I get messages from my team members saying, hey, uh, Jay, notice that you're a little manic. When was the last time you slept? Response, 36 hours ago. Why 36 hours ago, Jay? Well, uh, because uh, I uh, was uh, trying, try, trying to sleep and uh, I, I, I couldn't uh, because I, I realized that the level progression needs to be changed um, because it gets a little too steep. Uh, it, it's not that there's, there's a problem with it being difficult, it's just it's, uh, too, uh, too much of a spike too fast. Jay? Isn't that on the schedule that you laid out for all of us that we absolutely hate you for? Uh, yes, but it wouldn't um, be solved by Wednesday if uh, it wasn't. And it needs to be solved by Wednesday because we're going to PAX and there will be people at PAX who will not experience it. There are people at PAX who will put it down and walk away thinking that it's not for them. That's why. I don't encourage that type of thinking. I don't advocate for it. But at, at a certain point, you have to, you have to say, who can, we, who can we appeal to? How can we make this something that will touch people's lives. I know that WOW has touched a lot of people's lives, and I remember that early on there were some colorblind issues with that. And that was something that was fixed from what I've been told. I don't play WOW um, for, uh, remember about uh, 10 minutes ago? When, <laughs> uh, when I said that there were certain games I couldn't play and I just blamed them on their elitist communities and their poor design, uh, and really it was a thing for me. That's one of the, one of the games I don't play. Uh, I know that there were some issues with that early on, but, the, but that was something that they were able to fix. That was something that they were able to, to make better for people. So I'm going to ask you all, wholeheartedly, not as here are good reasons for you to make this, this game more accessible, the game you're working on, but I'm going to ask you wholeheartedly, Put yourself in other people's shoes. You know, don't just, don't just sympathetically look at game dev. Empathetically look at game dev. So I think I am actually running out of time now. Uh, I could be wrong. I've set my alarm to vibrate a little bit uh, whenever, whenever that's a thing. But uh, I'm sure someone will tell me to get off the stage when that happens. Seven minutes? Yeah, I can fill seven minutes. I hope I'm not absolutely dying up here. Please don't die. That's a lot of paperwork. No, not me. I hope, I hope I'm not. I hope, I hope that uh, I've not bored everyone to death about, here's why you need to make the best puzzle game in the world. No, that's, that's not what I'm here for. And I'll admit, I didn't expect to get as emotional up here as I'd, I'd done because, like I said, I'd, I'd planned something out for this. I usually do jokes. No one would like to hear my jokes. But yeah, it's puzzles for people. It's puzzles for, for everyone. It's, it's a way to say, I understand you. And there's always like a, like a, a component to, to indie devs. I've talked to so many developers, and they're like, well, I just, I just want to sell more units, and this is the best way to do it. And I'm like, OK, that's neat. Um, I, I'm not going to sit here and judge your reason for making a game more accessible. At the end of the day, all I care about is the fact that your game is accessible. But at the same time, like, that's not why I'm doing it. That's not why Collapsus exists the way it does. And I don't think I would have shipped Collapsus at all unless uh, Craig and, and Brian came to my table that day. I think it would have been another one of the 50 terrible prototypes. I'm not going to sit here and say that 
all games are high art, and all games are of massive importance to culture and will live on eternally. But if I, just, if I can just grab one person and say, here is me, here is you, I understand you, please understand me through this game, then I've got it. Collapsus would not have existed in, it, in its finished, true form without people coming to tell me, this is neat, this is going to be a wonderful little mobile game, you can do better. So, Collapsus uh, is slated for release later this year. We should be entirely finished with it. Uh, right before PAX East. Um, we are still working on some multiplayer stuff. Over 40 accessibility options. We're releasing in 10 different languages. We're releasing on Switch, PS4, PS Vita, Xbox One, Windows Phone, wow. Wii, wow. Wii U, <laughs> Ouya, Mac, Linux, PC, and Arcade. <laughs> hey, hey, you joke. I'm not officially allowed to say this, but we are talking to partners about retro releases. Um, so the thing is that you're probably wondering, like, why the heck is he still supporting Wii U, 3DS, Vita, Linux, Windows Phone? Why? I get emails from people. And they say, hey, I've noticed that your list says Wii U. I'd really like it if you'd still support it. And I do. And I will still support Wii U as long as there are people who will play it on Wii U as long as Nintendo will, will still allow us to do it. I mean, let's be real, the dev kit was insanely expensive anyway, so it'd be just a complete lost cause if I didn't. But why are we supporting 10 different languages? Let me tell you, it was just because I wanted as many people to play it as possible. It also doesn't hurt that my wife is a languages major, and she's finishing up, uh, she's finishing up learning 10 different languages. So, I mean... Not all of them completely cross over, but uh, there's a little something to do with that. But I, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to, to everyone who has ever felt like they've not had a game for them. Because with a little help, and I'm a little, little thick sometimes, but with a little help, that has gotten to me. People have said, do this thing, and I just hope that there are more people out there who are willing to, to take better steps, more steps, to make their experiences as playable as possible. It's not Collapsus puzzle, Puzzles for People. It is Game Devs Games for People. Thank you. <laughs>